Good evening. My name is Logan Court, and I'm a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues at Dickinson College. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that Dickinson College is on the unceded lands of the Susquehannock Nation. We acknowledge the many indigenous peoples that lived with these lands, as well as the thousands of indigenous children forced into the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in 1879 as part of a federal cultural eradication effort. On behalf of the Clark Forum and Dickinson College, I would like to welcome you to tonight's event, On Failure, a contemporary reflection on the heart of creativity. This program is part of the Clark Forum's semester theme, Failure. In 1956, Wilson Greatbatch was attempting to develop a heart rhythm sensor in his lab in Buffalo, New York. Without looking, Greatbatch grabbed the wrong resistor out of a pile of equipment. Through his failure to create a heart rhythm sensor, Great Batch accidentally invited, invented the first pacemaker. In 1928, Alexander Fleming, a bacterial scientist, left a pile of dirty petri dishes in his workstation before he left for vacation. When he returned, he noticed a strange bacterial growth that he would later identify as the life-saving drug penicillin. After multiple editors and publishers called James Joyce's novel unpublishable, Sylvia Beach saw promise in Ulysses and published what is widely known as the premier work of modernist literature. Repetitive failure and accidental creativity have formed some of humanity's greatest achievements. As a child in the United States, I was alternatively and contradictorily told that failure is the process by which we learn and create, and that failure is to be avoided at all costs as its effects are permanent. The American stigma of failure is in constant flux and the value we place on fa failure are either good or bad, depending on the time and context. Of recent, failure has been reconfigured as a positive force. In hopes of dispelling some of this stigma, I'm proud to introduce our speaker this evening, Professor Ana Marino. Ana Marino is an award-winning writer and a professor of Spanish creative writing and cultural studies at the University of Iowa. Her academic work specializes in comics and graphic novels. And she was the member of the International Comic Arts Forum Executive Committee from 2001 to 2011, and a director's board founder member at the Center for Cartoon Studies from 2004 to 2014. Her first poetry co collection, Preparativos para un Viaje, was awarded the, the renowned Premio Alones uh, Award. More recently, Marino is the recipient of one of Spain's most prestigious literary awards, El Premio Medal, and her novel, El Mapa de, for, for her novel, El Mapa de los Efectos. There will be a question and answer session immediately following the program, so please hold all questions at this time. We will be monitoring questions on our live stream, so feel free to answer, uh, place those in the chat at any time. The Clark Forum welcomes differences of opinion expressed politely, thoughtfully, and succinctly. Disruptive behavior or harassment of the speakers, member of the Dickinson community, or audience members will not be tolerated. As a show of respect to our speaker and anyone, everyone in attendance, please stay till the end of the program, including the question and answer session. At this time, I ask you to please silence all cell phones and other electronic devices. And now, please welcome me, join me in welcoming Ana Marina. Thank you so much. It's for me a great pleasure to be here with you at Dickinson College on remote, but my heart is in your beautiful campus that I had the pleasure to, to, to be there some years ago. I, I thank you, Mark Aldrich, for thinking about me to present on this fascinating subject, because it's a subject that keep, keeps me thinking a lot. So I decided first to, to touch a little bit in, in an experience I had with the idea of failure as a creative experience. And I'm going to share a, a PowerPoint. I think it is going to help to show some of my ideas. And then, uh, so we can follow my thoughts. <laughs> so uh, the idea of failure is a complex, a very complex one. And it's also linked uh, with the idea of, of be part of life and how we uh, understand a failure. The first time I, I approached failure and I had to think about failure was uh, years ago in 2007 in the University of St. Gallen. And then on St. Gallen on 2013, uh, I was with Sergio Shevhet. So it's a, it's a fantastic writer that just died and I, I really want to, 
to mention him. And I was also with Enrique Vilamatas and Santiago Gamboa. So we were uh, explaining our perspective about failure. The first thing, the first time I thought about what for me was the thinking of failure, I was linking the idea of society, what was happening on 20th century society with childhood, why poverty on societies who, who were really well developed wasn't being erased, why there was children in the streets. So I use as an example, uh, Los Olvidados, um, a film by Luis Buñuel from 1951, when Luis Buñuel, who had to go to exile from Spain, and first he was in New York and he was betrayed by Dali, by one of his friends from, from the college times. So he ended working in Mexico and trying to rebuild his life as, um, as a filmmaker. And um, his way to touch uh, his Mexican experience was reflecting on what was happening with society. So he created a fantastic and very touching critical movie about society incapable to take responsibility for childhood and speaking about children in poverty in very well-developed societies because in 1950, modernity was there, but modernity was failing to children. So for me, that was one approach I was doing, how intellectuals, how creative people was trying to address the failure of modernity. There was another artist that I thought was fascinating, and he's fascinating, Antonio Berni. He is uh, from Argentina, and he was born in 1905, and he died in 1981, and he created this character called Juanito Laguna, and he created kind of collage paintings, uh, speaking about this kid who was a kind of kid uh, surrounded by uh, poverty. So his pieces, his artistic pieces, were touching, you know, this is this painting is called The Promised Land of Juanito Laguna. It's from 1962. And it's pretty deep, as you can see, all the elements that is representing is representing. We can see uh, different elements. The same here, the character of Juanito Laguna. So this first approach I had was about how artists were reflecting and how artists were creating pieces, trying to criticize the failure of the dream of modernity. 20th century is a century full of very excellent things, development, inventions, creativity, but inequality um, was still there and artists were re reflecting to that and is this happening all over again and again right now in the in the 21st century so for me these two these two artists Buñuel and um, Antonio Berni were making me reflect on failure over the years as a professor at the University of Iowa I had to think also how a creator is living the life and how creativity is in dialogue of uh, existence itself. For me, a fantastic sample that I use a lot, and these are the, the images are, I'm going to use are um, uh, by Miguel Ancho Prado, he's a comic artist I love from Galicia, who create a really um, a group of drawings about Cervantes, who are very, very good to show. So for me, Cervantes is, um, a fantastic sample of failure and how he is in pain. He had a very complicated life and how for him, who was dreaming to be successful in theater and he wasn't successful in theater. And he, he created the greatest novel, eh, Don Quixote, who is the story of a man who fails constantly. He has dreams, he's, he's, he's a lunatic and he fails, but eh, he shows an amazing society. So Cervantes, uh, for me, is fascinating because he dreams to be someone else and he fails. Uh, he's also fascinating because, okay, we are in, in the middle of 16th century. Uh, he was born in 1547, 16th century. He died in 
in 22 of April of 1616, in the beginning of the uh, 17th century. And in that moment, Spain is, a, is, is, a, is an empire. And as an empire, we will see that Cervantes is, is, is a soldier. And that, if for me, is a very, very interesting element, because we are going to handle the personality of a soldier who goes to war, who is going to be um, hand, is going to suffer, who is going to be uh, having difficult, very, very difficult times in battle. Uh, he is going to lose. Uh, he is going to be, be kidnapped. and is going to be five years in prison in a hell. So we are going to see uh, the personality of, of of a soldier who is going to suffer pain who is going to lose the ability on one hand, who is going to be kidnapped and he's going to be uh, on jail as, as, um, as a prisoner of war uh, during five years. And that is going to make his personality and his life very complex. He's not going to feel success in any moment, just briefly. And with his success, he's going to feel a lot of pain. He's going to have different jobs, and, and these three drawings represent, first, when he's a soldier, he's trying to make his life as a soldier, then he's going to be a tax collector, and things are going to go wrong that way, because the bank he's going to work as a tax collector is going to go bankrupt, and he's going to end in jail. And uh, in jail, during the times he's going to end in jail, um, he's going to imagine the character of Don Quixote. So from that uh, painful experience is going to come an amazing piece. And that is fascinating. Then he's going to dream with the possibility of theater. But his theater, the pieces, the theatrical pieces that he wrote are going to take uh, many years after he died to be successful. Then after he writes uh, the first and publishes the first part of Don Quixote in 1605 and start to have success of that first part he wrote that in the first when he published that first part he thinks is his book complete book he's going to end having to write the second part of of the Quixote because someone else is going to take and write another Quixote so they, there is going to be someone who is going to plagiarize his piece to create another piece of Don Quixote, Avellaneda. So he's going to be so upset and so in pain thinking of someone taking over his characters, you know, stalling his characters and taking advance of his success with Don Quixote, that he's going to have to write the second part of Don Quixote. And that is amazing because the first part and the second part complete themselves to create the great piece, literary piece that he did. So it's fascinating that the betrayal of someone else, you know, um, um, Avellaneda, that mean betrayal that someone plagiarizes your characters, takes your characters to create a piece and take advantage of your characters, is going to be the push for him to write the second part and create a masterpiece. So from that painful experience that, you know, we will perceive as, you know, a failure to, to control evilness from someone else, many, many elements, but that is going to have a, such an impact on, on Cervantes. And at the end, this horrible experience is going to be the one is going to make him the greatest writer. So is when we discuss about how living the life and the experience we, we have in some ways are going to, you know, change our approach. Here we, ha we have a drawing that Miguel Ancho Prado did, you know, referring of his effort to try to sell his place because he was su successful with uh, Don Quixote, but nobody cares about his place. And his place, this, this, these pieces, these creative pieces that he, he really loved, to be, because he wants to be a, a very successful playwright and to be admired on, you know, a century later 
in, in 18th century is when they will start revisiting all the plays he wrote. So it's, it's a fascinating figure because of all that elements. He wants to be something else. He wants to be a playwright. Doesn't work. He's working and working. He is very creative, but he has to try to make a living. He ends as a soldier. He's, you know, he's prisoner of war. Then he tries to find a different job. You know, collecting taxes. Everything ends in a disaster. He ends in jail. He, in jail, he writes. He starts writing um, Don Quixote. He starts writing this great novel. He finally publishes that great novel. He starts, you know, enjoying some success. Someone is stalling his ideas and writing a book with his character. So he's furious. He has to write, you know, a second part of his book, you know, denouncing and criticizing the horrible person, Avellaneda, who created, he, he used his characters and wrote another piece. So for me, it's a very, very fascinating character. And also, in many, in many occasions, I use it with the students, with some of my students who are veterans of war, to show them life is very complex. And someone as, as fantastic as Cervantes, he went through similar experience because in that moment, Spain was an empire and soldiers you know, were part of, of the society. So for me, it's a, it's a great character to present and to think about how failure is part of creativity. And, and especially for, for Don Quixote, that is a masterpiece. And the characters fail all the time on their dreams, but at the same time, it's, 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 um, it's a lesson in humanity. Now I'm going to show you something, something very, very special that is also speaking about failure and is very original. This is uh, Joaquin Amigo. I just published a book uh, a, a, a fiction book that has uh, a non-fiction part is the is the archive of uh, the family of Joaquin Amigo. Joaquin Amigo was a very very good friend of Federico Garcia Lorca. Now we are moving to the twenties, nineteen twenties, and they were super friends. And um, and Joaquin Amigo, who was uh, Federico Garcia Lorca, was killed on the summer of 19, August 1936, and Joaquin Amigo suffered the same uh, horrible death in the same uh, nine days later than Federico García Lorca. What I love from the relationship, I've been investigating their, the archive of Joaquin Amigo, and I want just to show you this very beautiful little note. Uh, in 1928, Joaquin Amigo is, is, is preparing um, 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 an, an exam, uh, to access to to get a position in a university, and he fails the, the exam, uh, the, and he is very disappointed, of, obviously. But uh, Federico García Lorca wrote him a little, delightful little note, and here is the the two pieces. Here is the first page, and here is the the second the second piece of that little note. This is an original, non-published piece of Federico García Lorca. And in that beautiful little piece, and this is the picture of Federico García Lorca, and here is the picture of Joaquín Amigo, these are the two friends, he's telling, querido Joaquín, dear Joaquín, don't take it wrong, don't, don't suffer too much, you know, take it easy, he said in a very, very nice way, and don't take it for the tremenda, sino por la suavenda, it's like take it easy, very soft, you have to take this, you know, it was, you know, malapata and nada más, but bad luck, bad luck and nothing more. No, you are great. And he was great. Um, maybe it's for your good. Maybe, quizás sea por tu bien, maybe it's for your own, own good, you know. Um, he's, he's hoping for, for him that things will, will be good. This horrible experience is going to be good. Uh, at the end. And it's beautiful, the note, because in his note, in the way Lorca is trying to explain uh, to his friend Amigo, in this little so, super nose, nice note, he's telling, like, I believe you will find a university, uh, a position, don't worry. And he say, uh, and he's telling him, te acuerdas, do you remember el pateo? Pateo is when people go to the theater and, and use the feet to say, no, no, we don't like it. He say, uh, do you remember El Pateo de la Mariposa? La Mariposa was the first uh, play uh, Federico García Lorca did, uh, El Maleficio de la Mariposa. And he was very young and he was very excited to show his piece in Madrid 
and was a complete disaster. El pateo de la mariposa was a complete, eh, 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 el maleficio de la mariposa was a complete disaster. So Lorca, you know, says, was a complete disaster. Remember, remember, but he say, it's the best, lo mejor que me pudo pasar en mi vida literaria, was the best that can happen to me in my literary life, you know? And in some way, he's saying, I went down with El Pateo de la Mariposa, with this maleficio, this play I wrote, I put together, and I showed to everyone, hoping it was my first play, and was such a big disaster that I learned so much from that experience that, you know, it made me a better writer. So I love this little note that is, you know, delightful, and I love to, to be able to show it to you because it's a, it's a non-published piece of Federico García Lorca. So, um, uh, so that is beautiful. And then here I'm showing you when in 1927, uh, Federico uh, shows um, Mariana Pineda in Barcelona, uh, and he sent uh, uh, his friend Joaquín Amigo, this beautiful, um, you know, uh, note uh, explaining uh, this is successful. No, the, in in that moment, um, sending uh, the news, the great news that Mariana Pineda, you know, went well, and he sent a lot of kisses to everyone in Granada. No, he sent that a note, and I think uh, it's a beautiful way to see how time uh, for those those two friends and how uh, Federico was sharing the, the experience of theater with his friend Joaquin. So I I really like to show you the, the way friends, creative friends, speak each other and try to, to, to share uh, a note to comfort his friend when he fails the exam, explaining things will be better, I have also failures, and I managed to learn a lot from that failures. And then a lovely telegram in the distance, like, hey, I'm thinking about you, you know, gran éxito, Mariana, en todos estilos, abrazos a los amigos, no? He thinks on his friend, and he shared also success. So, and in some way, the, the end, the horrible end of both of them is a failure of society who, 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 who with war, with the horrors of war, you know, make this to wonderful men being killed and disappear. So um, I, I, I like a lot uh, of, of this note and, and this creative exchange and, and how Lorca was perfectly aware of, of the taste of failure with his first play, Maleficio de la Mariposa, and he was so creative to learn from, from that experience and share this experience with with his beloved friend, and, and I love to be able, many, many years later, doing research in a family archive to see that beautiful pieces of, of material and, and be able to show it with you. There is other moments of the Civil War. The Civil War in Spain was from 1936 to 1939, and as you see, Lorca was killed in the beginning, and many people, and Amigo, and Joaquin Amigo, and many people have to leave Spain. It was a very, very dramatic moment. And there is a beautiful piece. I was creating a piece, um, I was creating a, a, a different pieces for, for an exhibition in, in Washington that I hope will reach uh, Dickinson. And one of the comic artists, um, Anapurna, took over uh, to learn about people in exile, and she decides to work Concha Zardoya. And Concha Zardoya is a beautiful example of a, a great poet that, because of the uh, impact of a war and the pain of a war, uh, this is a failure of society, how a society fails uh, to, to, to be as should be, and suddenly war destroys lives as, as we are seeing today with what is happening in, in Europe. So Concha Tardoya, in, in this case, is, is a fascinating character because with this, the, her story of exile, she developed, you know, very fascinating poetry. And when Anapurna was uh, doing research about the impact of the exile in Spain and how 
poets were trying to to assume, you know, the the, the feeling of, of of failure. Of my society fails me. I I I don't know what to do with my life. I am, you know, following the path of suffering. In a creative way, try to express that pain and transform the the daily pain in something else. And it's something that uh, I like uh, on Concha Zardoya because she's going to develop very, very touching pieces. And in some ways, the pain of Concha is going to inspire Anapurna, this uh, young comic artist, that is going to try to transform the piece, uh, the poetic voice, this painful poetic voice, voice of Concha Zardoya speaking about the exiles, no? We are weeping today, as, as the poem says, uh, uh, there is a translation, we are weeping today between the earth and the sky, and, and Anapurna is using that verse to, to develop this kind of piece, graphic piece, where we see people arriving to the United States. Um, um, has the rain fallen, the cruel sun of the tropics, or the snow of the north into the old memory? So, um, Concha Zardoya is going always to try to express this sensation, this feeling of childhood, the missing pieces of life, and in in that way, is a very, very, very inspiring poet. No. Here is the love is a, is ancient, the profound sorrow that burns in one's soul encircles the eyes. The hundred forests lie within. From their breath we live of the sweet journey of glamorous cities. So, how she's going to try to describe this sensation of the exiles, the slim light that peers inside us. Does it dissolve the shadows? It is fire in a morse. Pure distant air, storm or temples, do they they always come from Spain? My the loving de device deceive us, oh to be children again. We tenderly wish in our dreams we play and forget about history. No, this idea of how we confront history, how we confront life, and how in some ways we want to go back to childhood. Is is a way to com you know confront this sensation of my country, my society fails, fails me. Because as, as we are touching the idea of feeling the fail, how we, you know, inspire ourselves from, from the pain of failure and how we define failure, you know, these this many ways to, to think about that. So I think Anapurna create a, a great piece combining you know, that sensation, combining that melancholic way and touching on, on the idea of, of all these people who had to leave a country in, in 1939, who were full of creativity, of imagination, wonderful life, and then they have to make sense of their life with this sensation of not having anything. So because failure can come from, from many aspects, of, from inside ourselves and from outside. No? So it was uh, the different thing, the different ideas I, I was thinking um, on the moment of, of touching on, on this fascinating, fascinating aspect. Then there is a, another piece. Then we are going to jump on the 21st century, and we are going to, to think about how writers now are speaking about self-fiction, how non-fiction, how life can be a very poetic tool about ourselves. And for that, I was very lucky of being a witness of Ordesa, Manuel Villas Ordesa. It's a fascinating book, and I was lucky because I witnessed the creative process of, of this fantastic novel that I really recommend you to read if you have the opportunity, because it's the story of, of 
of a man who fails, who, who from the suffering of feeling the total failure, he creates a masterpiece, a poetic masterpiece. So how the way of defining and explaining failure is, is a, a literary piece. And, and I was witness because it, he started writing this book, he's my partner, when we were starting to, to date. So I was the witness of a man who was down the hill in a very a creative man in a very bad moment of his life. And writing this book was a, um, an expression of love, a definition of failure, uh, how he felt himself in, in that moment of his life. He felt himself in down, 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 down. And how amazing it was, the result. Because he never, never imagined that this book will be super successful, translated in more than 30 languages, been touching many people's souls. So it's a fascinating piece because it's a very natural piece. It's a man, Manuel Villas, is speaking about his life, his memories, trying to make sense of the sensation he has of failure. And the beginning of the novel is extremely poetic and, and um, is also the way he approached uh, the philosophy of life. And, and as, as he starts saying, if humans, if only humans, human pain could be measured with precise numbers, not backwards, if only there were some way to assess how much we have suffered to confirm that pain has mass and measure, sooner or later, every man must confront the insustainability of his own passage through this world. Some humans begins, beings can stomach that. Not me, not ever. I used to look at the city of Madrid and the unreality of its streets and houses and humans felt like nails through my flesh. I have been a man of sorrows. I failed to understand life. Conversations with other humans in dull, slow, destructive. It pained me to talk to others. So he is a man down in the floor, you know, feeling he failed to understand life. He failed to, to, to develop happiness. He fails. He feels himself of a failure. And his meditation about that experience transformed itself into an absolutely poetic piece. And that, uh, for me to witness that, was amazing. Because I am an optimist. I'm very optimistic. And in the way I approach life, uh, I don't like, I don't know, I have a very practical approach. So I can feel failure. But failure doesn't put me down. So I can say, oh, this failed. I'm very practical. So I, I'm trying to, when, when I see the concept of failure, I try to analyze the ways fail, failures feel. So it's why I was approaching this kind of sociological, you know, critical, say, failure is not on us. It's on a society who has to take responsibility. How artists express this failure. So it's why I was speaking about Buñuel, or I was speaking about um, um, Bernie, Juanito Laguna, how these two artists are seeing, you know, children in the street, poverty, and how society is not capable of taking responsibility for that. Then, when I analyze the life of Cervantes, I am seeing a man who is um, down by society, he has expectations of himself because he's super talented and he's aware of that. But his hopes for his talent to be recognized goes to the wrong place because he expects theater to be his place and his novel. So there's this kind of irony. And then every time he's trying to be a little bit happy with success, you know, someone betray betrays, as, as we see on, on Del Quixote de, de Avellaneda, someone else, you know, writing another Quixote and taking advantage of the success of these two characters. And his response 
is going to make him to write the masterpiece that Cervantes is, uh, Don Quixote. So that is, is, is a fascinating way of how failure affects this single person. Then how we think on a society where artists, suddenly they lose everything, they have to go to exile, and how poetry is a way to help these people, as Concha Zardoya, to overcome the failure of a society who destroyed everything in a, in a civil war. Then I, I, I'm mentioning Ordesa, Manuel Vilas, because it's a beautiful piece of, of a poet, that Manuel Vilas is a poet of nonfiction, where his sensation of, I'm a failure, I'm a failure as a father, as a husband, he ends in a horrible divorce, uh, not being able to handle my life because he was drinking, he was having huge issues with alcohol, and I'm going to use this very fascinating page to show how he confronts in a very interesting way his, his drama of, of, of the alcohol. Um, and, uh, a ver, page 77. And he's, uh, he's, he's going to describe one of the moments that he's totally down. He ends in, no, it's 72, espera. Ah, it's 71. 73, I'm sorry. So, but, um, and in this moment, he's, 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 de he's describing one of the worst moments of his life, what had been that point of giving, um, my mother couldn't understand it. No, he's, he's confronting the relationship with his mother. What had been the point of giving her children a better life if she couldn't buy herself some, uh, those creams? He's having a... a She's, she's thinking about his mother and how he, there was the relationship with the mother. And she had some, she wants some creams for, for her beauty and she doesn't get them and she's upset. And deep down she was right. We hadn't managed to escape the lower middle class. At best, we might have moved from the lower class to the middle class. Sometimes I think it will be preferable to be utterly destitute, because if you just lo uh, you, you are just lower class, you still have hope. Being a beggar means shooting the door in hope's face. And there is something compelling about that. So he is so feeling so down and so depressed that he's thinking the character and, and Manuel himself about what was to be in society how, what was meant to be lower class, middle class. It's a very fascinating book about many elements. And at the same time, he is, you know, having to confront uh, alcoholism and alcoholism as, as a failure uh, of his emotionality, how alcohol is going to be the way he's going to try to, uh, to protect himself from his monsters and he's going to be the big monster on, on his life, this drinking uh, relationship. So on the, on the book, we are going to discover the way he is feeling. He's going to open up about the impact and the, and the horror of, of, of being alcoholic and how he's overcoming that. So um, it is a very, very fascinating book on, on that matter because um, thinking about family, thinking about life, thinking about uh, elements in life, addictions are going to put him lower the lower. And the way of describing that experience is going to be extremely poetic, is going to touch in society, on, on family life, on emotions, on so many elements. The sensation of being a, a total failure and the poetic expressivity of that sensation is going to create pure literature. So suddenly, for him, was a redemptory experience because it's going to be a cathartic experience. And when he's writing this piece, because I was witness of that, he wasn't thinking he was writing a masterpiece that was going to be super successful. He was writing 
in a cathartic way to make sense of all the deep suffering he was having inside him. So was so deep the suffering, was so deep the sad, was so deep the feeling of failure that he failed, that he was in incapable, was so deep that he needed to, to verbalize his pain and his suffering. And in that experience, he creates a masterpiece. And I say I was a witness because I was a witness. I, was, I read the five different beautiful versions he wrote until he created the super masterpiece. And he was doing it because of a necessity, an emotional necessity. And he was thinking, oh my God, nobody is going to want this book. This book is, is nonsense. So he was thinking that. So imagine his face when you know the piece became a bestseller. So it was like the opposite of his sensation of failure was, uh, he was amazed, like he's still amazed. Every time there's a new edition, a new translation, he's still like, what happened here? Because this book is representing my lowest moment in life, my deepest suffering in life, and suddenly it's giving me so much, so much love. So that I think is a it's a very, very interesting experience to witness that, you know, and, and to and to perceive that. And I want to 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 close um, this this little talk to bring questions to the table or to have an exchange of ideas with a poem of myself that I wrote that in some ways uh, is what I was expressing, how for me failure is, is as a creator, when I think about failure, I think about society. For me, it's the failure of society. So I, I think I'm moving a little bit the concept of failure that we've been touching and I'm mentioning and to this idea of how we define the pain of others. The pain of others is a failure when we all are responsible of what is happening. So we are failing our society. And for me, one aspect that makes me reflect a lot are the migratory movements, the desperation of many people from the north of Africa trying to reach Spain and the peninsula. And for defining that in a poetic way and make this kind of approach, I wrote uh, different poems. And this is a poem that I use the concept of rock, paper, and scissors, this, this children game that I think we all play in some moment in our life because it's a kind of very international ch uh, children game, rock, paper, and scissors. And I use it to describe the hardship of all these people who, who, who their society fails them, their countries fails them. They need to leave their countries. They need to try to reach Europe. And they, they fail to do it this because the trip is too horrible, it's too difficult, and they die in the sea, in the Mediterranean Sea. So I use... Uh, this image of rock, paper, and scissors to describe that uh, painful experience, what this is happening to these people. Rock called a silent corner next to the lap of the dead. Paper to write a few brief lines, the rubbish farewell of the traveler. Scissors to cut off the tongue of the sea when it sits. Scissors to cut out the dreams of the drone, paper to write down their names, rocky, straight, little paper boat, scissors like reps, a melancholy poem for those who were left breathless at the edge, at the edge of the sea. Stone tears, paper raft, and the mouth of the sea with scissors like teeth. So the, the poem is expressing that sadness, what the reality of that people. And for me, it's very painful as a creator, as a writer. So my way to confront the failure of society is writing pieces who address the victims of the failure of society. You know? And, in, and this, in this case, all these migrants who try to reach a better land, they've been failing on their trying because they they die, but they fail because the societies, their society, European society and their own society, their countries fail them. So I, I, I touch on that thinking about failure as, as, as a concept 
that criticize, you know, the present. So I, I'm bringing a different idea. I think different. We see in these presentations uh, different concepts and different ideas. So I think now maybe it's the moment to open the questions and the exchange of ideas, so we can keep thinking about that different aspect of of creativity and how creativity is coming from different places. So thank you so much. It is now time for the question and answer session. Because this event is being recorded, please wait for a microphone to reach you before asking your question. We will now take the first question. Thank you so much for this very provocative presentation. Um, there's so many thoughts in my head right now, but I'll just try um, to address one right now. As you were telling this, uh, the, the own narrative that you construct in the presentation, I was, I was thinking about this relationship between failure and creativity and imagination. And it, we're often um, inspired by stories where artists' creativity is in deep relationship to failure, sadness, melancholy, um, as though that is what um, sort of feeds their creative opportunity. But in listening to your talk, I'm wondering more about that relationship between failure and creativity. And in some ways, they don't seem opposed. In other words, it's not that artists' beautiful creativity somehow runs into contact with failure in a productive way or that failure itself is productive, but they really seem like kindred spirits. So fa failure is outside of bounds. It doesn't live up to the structure, right? That is sort of the essence of failure, as is creativity. Creativity breaks out of bounds, breaks through structures. So there seems to be a resonance, oddly, between the two of them. And so I'd, I'd love to hear you, um, just looking at your poem, too, the, the poem fails in, its, in the innocence of the, the game. Someone's supposed to win rock, paper, scissors. That's the whole point of playing. But no element comes out on top. And so the, the child's um, game um, also fails in the poem. So anyway. Um, Sorry if that's kind of the main question, the relationship between failure and creativity. Yeah, it's, it's why, why I say thank you so much for the question, because it's fascinating. Because um, I think uh, uh, failure and creativity, and we see different samples. Like when we see Lorca being aware of a failure and seeing the failure of, of, of his play as an experience to be more creative, and as a learning experience, is when failure is productive. And that uh, that is very, very interesting. It's, as well, it's what we expect, like, oh, failure is a learning experience, it's productive. The feeling of failure is productive because us, as an individual, we can confront our own failure. The problem that I was adding to create things, the same with, with uh, uh, Cervantes. Cervantes is not, unfortunately, he's not going to be aware of the success. Lorca, in some way, yes. Cervantes is going to be frustration after frustration, but this frustration as a failure is going to be very, very creative at then, how he's going to grow up and he's going to respond. Oh, someone is stalling my ideas. Someone is using my car. I'm going to write a second part and I'm, he's going to listen to me. And from this second part of confronting, reacting, to this sensation of abuse is going to be a, a masterpiece result. So there is different ways of, of awareness when you are a creative person and you are going to take the experience of failure. But why, when you are seeing the failure of society, you know, failure as a whole around you. And th that is what is happening with um, when you see poverty, when you see war, when you see injustice. It's a, someone is, you know, something is failure, something is, Algo falla, something is going down. There is a failure of society, fracaso, you know, this idea of, so our creators are reacting. In some ways, when you react to that, and it's true in, 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 the, in the analyze you just did of uh, rock, paper, and scissors, rock, paper, and scissors is a ludic play. It's a ludic game. You're supposed to be having fun. You're supposed to win. Someone is going to win, but here we see nobody's winning. Everyone is going down the, the water, and, 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 and this death 
of these people who daily, because this poem start, I wrote many years ago, when I was in shock reading the news that that was happening. And the thing is, these things are still happening. People every day is dying trying to reach Europe in boats, in very weak boats, like paper, who go down. And where the rocks of the sea, and where the, you know, the, the sea is cutting that boat, you know, the force of the water. So, uh, you know, yeah. So the way, the symbolic way of expressing that pain, uh, that failure, uh, develops, you know, a, a creative narrative, but it's a very painful narrative. I don't know if I'm answering the question, but yeah, it makes me think, yes, about, about, you know, how we can develop a, an intellectual discussion about different failure. So slightly unrelated to your talk, but also just um, throughout your talk, you talked about a lot of different forms of literature, whether it was poetry, novels, and I know you have a background in poetry and as an author, um, but you also have a working background in comics and graphic novels. So I'm curious how you see uh, graphic literature and comic literature as related to other forms of creativity. Yeah, I'm very, I, I see all of the mix and I end using, you know, Miguel Ancho Prado, who is a comic artist, drawings of Cervantes, the narrative way he, he addressed the life of Cervantes or Anapurna. So I think comics are an excellent uh, tool, creative tool, expressive tool, and are very uh, uh, fascinating pieces of, of comics uh, that um, are making us uh, think and reflect on society. And there was a lot of discussion recently about mouse and ma suddenly mouse, Arthur Spiegelman mouse. That is an excellent piece about re reflecting of of the, the life of his father and his mother in Auschwitz and, and what happened in, 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 in the history and suddenly being erased from, from the schools. Like what is going on suddenly that a fantastic piece that is part of our history and, and should be part of, of the reading list is problematic. Now, what is going wrong? No? And, and comics is a very expressive way. Comic artists are a fascinating type of creative person because especially authors, um, they have to combine the narrative, the narrative aspect of the piece and the drawing. So are a, a, a very focused type of creators on my experience who have a lot of uh, dedication a very, very deep dedication to, to, to finalize their pieces. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could touch on your work or experience with the International Comics Art Forum in the Center for Cartoon Studies. Well, that, uh, my experience in, in ICAF and, and the Center for Cartoon Studies are an example of success <laughs> and I and and it's very very interesting because in some ways uh, comics have been considered uh, you know non-important for many years and now I can see that this had been changed but in the old times now I'm 50 so in the old times when I was a, a, a university student I was very young uh, I choose to do to work on comics and my faculty my professors were like wait 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 you know what I mean? How you are going to manage to 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 find a job? You know, in that moment, the comics didn't have that that recognition. So I was witnessing, in the same way I witnessed what happened with Ordesa, I witnessed how you know James Storm at the Center for Cartoon Studies in White River Junction was a comic artist with an idea, who decides to create a school for comic artists to develop their graphic novels. He had that idea, and that idea, we are speaking about 2004. You know, uh, a, a young comic artist who had a dream, and he, de he decides to go for it, convince people in the community, in White River Junction, say, let's develop creative economy. We suddenly saw his vision and say, yes, we should, I'm going to support you to create a nonprofit to support comics. So let's get together, let's help, let's involve other people. And this, this is a, an example of successful experience from creativity, from an idea. 
And he put all his effort, James Storm, and he succeeded. He did it really well. And now the Center for Cartoon Studies is, is a reference place in Vermont, is where if you want to be an author, a comic artist who write and, and draw at the same time, who wants to create graphic novels, you will go to the Center, the Center for Cartoon Studies. The same with ICAF. ICAF, the International Comic Art Forum, I was there uh, for many years, for a decade. Now I have my, my graduate students of mine who now are professors. <laughs> so when, when your graduate students now are full professors, it's, it's a sign that, wow, you, you are old already. And it's very nice. It's very nice because suddenly you see people following your path and your ideas and, and taking over because uh, when you are a scholar, what you want is to develop other scholars who can keep going and keep doing research on that aspect that you are touching. So ICAF was also an, an idea of a group of scholars who decides is the moment to create an international conference that touch on comics in different countries. And we are going to you know, push for, for, for forums where to develop academic conference about international comics and, and to analyze different aspects of comics and to vindicate comics in the scholarly world. And that is a, a very important battle, like how to introduce comics in the, in the academic space. Now it's very natural. Now everyone see as something natural. Eh, 25 years ago, people were not as open to the idea of bringing comic books and graphic novels on the a discussion of humanities. It was a space that we had to open and uh, how to bring knowledge. Now we are having different battles. Now humanities are being at risk, so we need to protect humanities because humanities is the space of critical thinking, is the space of empathy, is the space of love, is the space of thinking of failure. O sea, is the space where we can achieve philosophical thoughts about the human condition that can transform human conditions. I think creativity are the tool in the humanities world, the tool for everything else. I, I think this type of communication, this type of thinking about humans is what give us sense as humans. Like we can see other species like ants, they create tunnels and they do amazing things. But you know, the way we have to think of ourselves and to communicate to each other, to create narratives, to to imagine things is what brings us humanities to be human. So I'm, I, you know, I know humanities are under attack and I always try to protect humanities. Thanks very much for your talk. It was really fascinating. I was wondering if you could speak briefly to uh, any of your experiences of dealing with failure with your creative writing students and how this, how you can, for just to give one example, when a, a, a writing project how to decide if it's time to just abandon a project or to go back and rethink, rewrite, et cetera, and how mm. different understandings of failure play into that. Yes, uh, that is a very, very excellent question. How do you handle failures in the emotional sense of, of people around you? That is uh, it's the most difficult because as I was telling, I'm very pragmatic. So my way, my, my tolerance to failure, like is kind of pragmatic, as I say. I, I don't allow fail, the sensation of failure to touch me too deep. Um, and I think I know because the reason I, I managed to not. I'm epileptic and epilepsy, when you are an ad, a, a young kid, a, a children and you grow with epilepsy, you, you suddenly have to be very aware of the limits of your body. So, because you know that in, in, if you don't control your body, you can fall down and have an attack and has a horrible impact on you as a... So when you have to learn to handle an illness, or, you know, a kind of limitation with your body, that is an illness like, like epilepsy, makes you being very pragmatic. You don't want mm, to be hit very badly by emotions because the sensation of failure in the creative way can be very 
very, very devastating. And if you al allow something to be very devastating, okay, some people will feel devastating and will take addictions. But people who had, like in my case, since I was very young, having epilepsy, I will always try to, ooh, I didn't want to have attacks. I had very clear in my mind, okay, if I, I want my body to be controlled, because I don't know if my body is going to lose control. So that made me be very pragmatic and in some ways learn to a kind of mindfulness without knowing that was mindfulness to, you know, being able to let it go, let it go. So in some, in some ways with the students, what I try to help them is to let it go, let it go. If the sensation of failure is not going to be creative, let it go because it's going to damage you. So sometimes a student, I don't believe like uh, things will not work in, in the matter like, oh, this is terrible. So threw it out. I, I believe more on the experience of thinking and writing. So I always recommend my students to write diaries. I'm a big fan of diaries. And, you know, here's my notes, my notebook full of notes and reflections, because from that experience, you can take yourself in a critical way and see what do you want to say and how these things touch on you uh, in, so, in some ways, no? I am also uh, trying to make them think, are you communicating? Is this what you want to say exactly? Or if this is not working, let it go, put it till later and try to start uh, another thing. And I have uh, students who maybe were working, you know, in three chapters of a, of a novel and they realize themselves like that, oh, this is not what I want to do, let's do something else. So. Uh, in, in in that matter, what I always try to show them, and in in this in this way, how you con contemplate other writers' life and experience, is very interesting because Cervantes he he wrote, and he finished uh, uh, Don Quixote in, the, in his sixties. Manuel wrote Ordes in his fifties. So you are not going to reach the idea of success, and success is going to come, maybe or maybe not. What you have to think is why do you write? Why do you, why you choose to be a creative person? Do you enjoy that? What is the reason you make this decision about yourself? So that is one of the things I, I try help them to help them. Then if this is what they love to do, let's let's keep going. Let's keep enjoying. Then if you are failing with ideas or with a piece, let's learn more. Let's read more books, let's read more pieces, more poems that help you to understand. Because as the, pro the creative process is not just you writing, it's you learning. And the ways you learn to be a better writer is reading. So I try to combine that. I try to, if I see a piece that is not working, but I can see where, where this writer wants to go, I recommend books that are going to help this writer to understand what he's trying to say. So that is my, my strategy. I had a question. Um, your talk made me reflect on contemporary depictions of failure that I've consumed in terms of media, literature, film, et cetera. And I've noticed that most of them tend to result in success. Like it'll be like a loser or a failed playwright or someone, but eventually there's a redemption arc where they have a light bulb moment and they become successful or whatever. And I can think of far fewer examples where someone fails and fails and fails and that's it. <laughs> and I, I'm, part of me thinks that's probably because that's kind of depressing to watch and the average consumer of this media like wants to believe that there's hope if they're stuck in a rut. So I'm wondering what your take on this and if you think this is like a modern reality, um, like a 21st century thing, or yeah, just wondering your thoughts. Yeah, it's very, very interesting, the, the question, because it's true that the narratives of entertainment, the narrative of, of US entertainment is a very, is a narrative of falling down, going up, of success from pain. In the case of Don Quixote Cervantes, Forget it. This poor man, the character Cervantes created, is going to fail constantly in every chapter. 
he's a good soul. Everything goes down the hill. And the stories around are going to be very painful stories, but are so beautiful to learn. So different societies handle failure in different ways. And if you see Cervantes, Cervantes, I think he, he, he thought, well, I failed to be a playwright. That is what I want. I had half of my life I was in fight with, you know, as a soldier, you know, trying to make a better life. So in, in my culture, we don't have that idea of success. Or one of our best writers, who is Federico García Lorca, who was the best of the best, was killed in the beginning of a war, in the horrible manner, without clemency. So it's a story of a failure because, you know, our society destroyed one of the most creative, talented person in his best moment. He was in the hysteries, for God's sake, you know. So, so in my culture, the, that idea is not engraved in the way that we see in the, in the U.S. because there is this kind of feel-good on the consumption of movies. So you go to see a movie or you go to read a book and at the end you, you want to feel good. I want to feel good. I, I, I write uh, in my, my fiction, there is a lot of failure, there's a lot of pain, but always bring a kind of reflection. More than a success, more than success, is kind of content to understand, okay, this is the limit of life, this is what happened, this is the pain. So I'm going to content, I'm going to learn from that. But success is not a, what maybe in the U.S. society is success. So I, you know, it's different cultures are going to handle a, the narrative of failure and success in different ways. And sometimes there is not going to be success. And you have, you have to keep going with, with this idea of failure and to come into terms with the limitations of failure and what failures means. This concludes tonight's presentation. Please join me in thanking Professor Marino. Thank you so much.